I'm Gary Carter, and in the next few weeks, we're going to learn what it takes to launch a startup from initial concept to launch. We have a team of mentors from Silicon Beach and a team launching their startup right now to teach us the process. We embrace and learn from our successes and failures. Welcome to Concept to Code. Today on Concept to Code, we're going to learn about software development. If you're following our launch schedule, at this stage, you've refined your business idea, are applying the lean startup cycle, and are focused on development of your beta site or app. To help us learn the rules of the road for software development, I'm pleased to welcome our guest mentor, Dr. Tony Corer, the founder and CEO of Tech Empower. Dr. Corer works as a part-time CTO for startups and mid-sized software companies, helping them to get the product out the door and resolve technology issues. He is known for working with numerous startups and was the original CTO for eHarmony during its first four years. He has worked on projects for many companies, including Citibank, IBM, HP, and Microsoft. Tony, please join us. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much, Gary. Okay. Well, I'm excited to be here today. And what I'm planning to do is talk through some rules as I see them for software development for startups. And this comes from 15 years of experience of doing development with startups. And some of them may be a little bit different than what you might expect a technology person to be talking about. So let's go ahead and look at rule number one. And my first rule is, is actually do as little coding as you possibly can. And the reason for that is really that, there, well, there's two, two big things. Code costs a lot of money. It's very hard to go out and build code to prove something out. And we'll talk about some other ways you can try to prove out things for your startup. So again, we're assuming you're at the point where you're ready to get into development, but I suggest you do as much as you can to prove out what you can for your startup prior to getting into any code. So uh, the other thing we should talk about is not only just the cost of the development itself, but it's something we like to refer to as technical debt. Technical debt is accumulated as you go and build code. And it comes from often from trying to push to get as much code out as you can, as much features out as you can to try to prove things out for your software. Um, and it just accumulates, well, uh, issues within the code. You go fast and you don't design it quite as well. And then every change you go to make costs you more than what you would want it to. And so the first features get out there really quick and then the next feature takes a little more effort. The next feature takes a little more effort. Pretty soon you start seeing bugs occurring in different places in the code. And so it's not only the initial cost, but every change you make from then on is going to take more and more uh, for, your, for your company. And so if you start you know, feeling this debt accumulate on you and maybe you've needed to pivot a few times, it's way better to have done less in code and to have focused on exactly the right thing out of the gate. And this is going to underlie a lot of the other rules. So let's take a look at the second rule here. The second rule is, is a key one and often I see founders somewhat struggle with this. It's uh, when I go and I talk and I try to find out what it is we want to go build, I always really want to know about their metrics and their key proof points. Uh, so if you're familiar with the Lean Startup methodology, you're always trying to go and try to hit, hit some early proof point. You should do as little as you can to prove the next hypothesis. And so I, I'm going to ask you before I go off and go build anything, well, what is it you're trying to prove? So with eHarmony in our early days, uh, we built our initial version. And basically that initial version was showing us, did people log into the system? Did they meet potential marriage partners? Uh, did they give us their credit card? And basically a lifetime value. And so we had that kind of number uh, early on. And then we spent a lot of time proving out on the marketing side. What marketing channels were going to be successful in getting customers at a price point that we could afford? And so in reality, we spent uh, you know, six months on the initial product to prove lifetime value. And then we spent three and a half years proving out, do we have a scalable model for, for marketing? And so you, you have to be aware of what exactly you're trying to prove. So the other thing about that, and it goes to eHarmony as well, is if you're not familiar with uh, Dave McClure's R, uh, his pirate metrics, then you should definitely go check that out. He, he refers to the, the main five categories of metrics as acquisition, how do you get your customers, activation, how do you engage with them, retention, how do you keep them, referral, can you get them to give you additional customers, and revenue, how do you get money out of them? So 
definitely check out Dave McClure's stuff on that. Now, relative again to eHarmony, when we first started out, we, we, we figured out uh, activation, uh, we figured out retention, we figured out revenue, so we had a pretty good idea of lifetime value, and then we spent a lot of time in acquisition. But when I'm going to code, I want to know specifically, well, what metrics am I trying to, to hit? Well, what are we trying to do with our product to try to hit that, and what's that proof point? And if a founder can't tell you that, if you're not aware of that proof point, then you're going to be spending a lot of money on code that you probably shouldn't be spending. I will say the other thing about it is, often you'll, I'll hear a founder say, uh, well, what I'm trying to achieve, my proof point, is to show this to an investor. That's a classically bad idea as a proof point. The investor really wants to know the metrics. They want to know, are you able to get the engagement numbers you want? They, they want to know the numbers at the end of the day. So just showing them the product doesn't tell them anything. And if you just need to show them, there's other ways to do that. Which actually, let's, let's move on to the next rule. So, um, you know, I want to know your proof points. I want to know your metrics. Uh, you can often get some early proof points without writing any code at all. Uh, so there's things out, well, first thing you can do is build a, just a paper prototype. You can build it out in graphics using PowerPoint, or you can even do wireframes. And you should always build those out and show them to potential customers. And that'll give you an idea of whether or not uh, you've got something that's going to potentially engage uh, the end user. And you can push these prototypes to th things called smoke and mirror prototypes. A smoke and mirror prototype, the person can actually click around in there. They can get the experience of working with the software without actually having to build any of the software. There's some great tools out there to build really quick, easy um, software products. So uh, a couple, well, about a year and a half ago, I worked with one startup company. They came to me, they asked me to build out this, this big uh, system, had a very nice revenue model to it. But we all had questions on whether they're going to be able to acquire their customers. Were people really going to sign up, give them their credit card? So rather than building any of the actual software product, what we did is we took and hacked together WordPress. Uh, we gave it an actual transaction page, and there was no system behind it. And so they could see all the marketing materials, and they bought ads, and they'd bring them over to the site, and then they'd try to get them to actually give their credit card information. And that proved to us well, actually, we had to change it around quite a bit along the way, but we found marketing messages, we found um, paid search that worked in order to convert the customers. And so we could prove out that our acquisition part of the model worked without ever having built any of the back end. Now, once we'd proven that out, we, of course, didn't actually take their money. Um, and then once we actually built it out, then, then we knew we had an end-to-end -end product that, that really worked. So we could prove the acquisition without ever really building it. So it's a lot of smoke and mirrors often early on, and you want to concentrate on doing that so you don't have to build code you don't really need. Let's move on to the next rule. Um, the next rule is really about making sure that you are telling your developers exactly what you need. Uh, and this kind of goes back to our previous thing. So when you're prototyping, um, doing all those things to, to make sure that your end customer is going to uh, welcome that product, um, you're, you're, you know, getting, you're getting the f some feedback. Okay, now you need to go get your developers to build something out. This is a place where a lot of software development falls apart. It is really easy to walk into a room, whiteboard up, show some you know, rough diagrams, tell the developers, hey, this is what I need over the next week. So Agile, it's very common to have weekly sprints. You get together in a meeting, uh, you talk about what you need to do over the next week, and then you have daily scrum meetings where they, you, know, you talk through, here's what I'm going to be doing the next day. Um, a lot of miscommunication can happen on that weekly sprint planning. So if you haven't detailed out with wireframing tools and with some functional notes, here's what it is I need you to go build, and you walk through the details, then the developers are going to go off and do their best effort, but they're, they're likely to not build exactly what you, it is you wanted. So uh, it's, it's really important to spend the time documenting it. And that falls back on the founders. So your developers are going to build whatever you tell them to build, and you almost have to think of them like a computer. They're going to build exactly what it is you tell them to build. So if you leave things open for interpretation, expect them to build something wrong. Okay? But they, they did their best in most cases, and it's often this miscommunication that's really important. So if you're not spending time on wireframes and functional notes, you're, you're making a big mistake, and you're spending money on code that you didn't need. You're accumulating technical debt that you didn't need, because every time you change software, you accumulate technical debt. If you've not seen wireframing tools, there's some great ones on the market, like Basalmic. 
Uh, there's a founder I've been working with recently, very non-technical. He's picked up Balsamic. He's not really a good UX guy. We're going to get a UX person to come in to fix up what he's doing, but it's been great as a way for him to show the team, here's what I roughly need to build. On to the next rule. So um, in some cases, actually this is the founder I just talked about is a great example of this. Uh, he's very non-technical. He needs to engage with developers. There's often a pretty big gap between what a developer knows to ask and what a founder knows to tell the developers. So uh, are they asking the right questions about things like, well, do we need logging in our software? Or do we need an email service provider? Uh, what are we doing about uh, different platforms, mobile? Uh, is it mobile web? Is it native app on mobile? So there's a lot of things that developers should be asking the founder about, and they may or may not ask about those. And similarly, the founder doesn't know enough to direct the team. So you've, you end up with this thing called a founder-developer gap. Uh, it's very common out there. And it's actually fairly easy to close. Now, I, I have kind of an advantage. Well, that, that's sort of what I do every day. But I also uh, run the LA CTO forum. There's 250 CTOs in there. At least half of them commonly come on to take on technology advisory roles. And they can come on and, and take care of exactly this gap. And so if you are a non-technical founder and you're trying to work with developers, and developers, you need them because they're going to be coding every day, ne you need to make sure you get help in the room. They can help you bridge the gap, make sure you're building the right kind of technology. Okay, and on to rule number six, last rule of the day. Um, this is kind of a, a, an, an interesting challenge for especially early stage startups. You want to get features out the door. And the classic thing with Agile, again, is that you, you know, each week you have a sprint and you're going to focus on the features you can build over the next week. Well, last week I had a call with a founder whose biggest complaint was, We've got some great developers. They're doing a really good job of pushing features out each week. But they just seem to iterate on all of these small changes, and they never get to the big picture stuff. So when are they going to do this next big feature for me? And the problem with that is they sort of, as a team, have misunderstood Agile. So in Agile, you're always focused on these weekly sprints, but you also need to focus on the big picture, what's called a product backlog. And so that product backlog is going to have a prioritized list of all these features. And you have to get out of the mode of saying, well, it's always these things we can do the next week. Maybe you need to push those down in priority and prioritize some of the bigger picture issues. So it really falls back often on the founders who need to take on a product management role in order to prioritize things appropriately so that they have that long picture view. Uh, the other thing I'll say about the long picture is that product backlog can often give insight to the developers about where they need to be focused. If you remember technical debt, a lot of it, a lot of technical debt comes from designing things without being aware of where you're going. And so uh, making sure you've got that, uh, you've got some forward picture for your developers is really a key. So I want to thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tony, for your presentation on software development. Uh, when we come back, we're going to meet our startup team favorite and listen to their discussion with Tony on software development. Riding a bicycle can seem like child's play, but only if you're playing indoors. <laughs> Cars and bikes need to play together. Play it safe. Ride by the rules. Hey, share the road. Welcome back to Concept to Code, a show focused on giving you the skills to launch your startup. I'm your host, Gary Carter, and today we're learning about software development. Our featured startup is a company called Favorite. We're pleased to have co-founders Anka Audenart and Andres Rodriguez of Favorite. Let's listen into their discussion with Tony Carrer. Thank you, Gary. So my name is Anke Audenaert. I'm one of the co-founders of Favorite. Favorite is a platform that helps users bookmark their physical places. So we're developing an app right now that helps users to save, recall, share their favorite places that could be restaurants, stores, etc. And then they can get recommendations based on what they like and what their friends like. Uh, before Favorite, I was um, well, co-founded the company Jump Time uh, together with Andres. Jump Time was focused on um, software. It was basically building software to optimize websites. Uh, we sold Jump Time to OpenX, an ad tech company uh, here in Pasadena. 
Before Jump Time, I was at Yahoo. I was there for about eight years, heading up uh, market research and web analytics, and that's basically kind of where my background is. I also teach digital marketing at UCLA Anderson. Right, uh, and for me, I also did uh, Jump Time with Anke. Um, before that, I was for many years at um, SRI, which used to stand for Stanford Research Institute. I was doing research in um, uncertainty in artificial intelligence. Um, and we applied a lot of that, uh, those techniques to uh, jump time. And now, hopefully, we can apply the same type of techniques um, of machine learning to a very smart recommendations engine where you can learn where to go, uh, either via for a restaurant or for a trail or for a shop, uh, by using what your friends around you like, what right. your social network around you likes. Well, that sounds like a really interesting application. I can't can't wait to, to start using it <laughs> we myself. We think so. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I'm curious. Um, so, you know, part of what I was talking about was the things you should do ahead of building code, mm -hmm. right? And and yeah. actually, so so tell me what stage you're at first with with the coding. Sure. Um, I think we're now at a point where we're almost ready to launch our app in the App Store. Okay. So we're basically finalizing uh, to submit it to the App Store. We've been coding since um, March. Um, that's not me. They have been coding since March. Okay. Um, before that, we did actually a lot of work. Uh, we took about three months to get, uh, basically go from an idea on paper that was scribbled in a notebook to developing wireframes that were just focused on UX, then adding the UI, adding a ton of um, notes that just describe the functionality of every little piece that we could think of in the app, and then starting to develop code. So okay. that's basically how we approached and, and, it. And what did you do with that to help try to validate that you had the right product design? And yeah, so we actually, so we did, um, we ran some of our kind of ideas and screens initially from the things that we had on paper to then the pieces that we had in terms of UI. We ran that by users, potential users, okay. users of competitive products, um, pretty intense users of these types of products to just validate that we kind of had the right idea there and that they liked this type of functionality that we were describing. We also used very early on um, a small prototype that Andres developed actually. Um, and we used it among the two of us just to make sure that that functionality worked. It was kind of, I would say ugly, but since he's here, I won't. <laughs> 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 but it wasn't like the nicest tool, but it functioned really well. And it told us that we at least liked the idea. We're very excited about and it. That's, that's interesting that you even, I mean, you, you've been doing all of the design and even you s yourself, you wanted a prototype so you could play with it yourself and make yeah. sure that it was still, so I mean, it shows a lot of, a lot of preparation going into it and then now and so so tell me now you, you've done all this background work you start getting into development what does the process look like that you use so team? we 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 put a lot of emphasis on design uh, I think that nowadays with so many uh, applications and software out there is very important uh, design is very important to get noticed um, so we put a lot of emphasis in that at the beginning uh, and once we had the design set up, then uh, we have a team of uh, four developers. And that team of four developers, uh, basically, um, we pretty much, every, everyone does everything. Uh, we go through the typical agile development where um, we had the designs, we had the wireframes based on that. We pretty much divided the work. Um, and each screen we attack a certain amount of problems that we put on, we use an online tool called Asana. Yep. Um, we put everything that we need to do on that online tool. That online tool is very well uh, targeted towards agile development. Uh, so you have your typical backlog and everything that we plan to do goes in the backlog and at the beginning of the sprint, uh, sprint are, are uh, chunks of uh, one week of development mm -hmm. and at the beginning of that sprint we take from the backlog everything that we're planning to develop during that sprint and then at the end of the sprint we figure out how much we got done. Uh, we see whether we are under or overestimating how fast we can develop. Uh, we recalibrate everything and everything begins anew <laughs> okay. next week. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> Very classic uh, agile yeah. process. Yeah. Um, and, and it sounds like you've got a lot of preparation that goes into each weekly planning. It's not like you sit there on a whiteboard on the Monday meeting and try to sketch things out. There's been a lot no, of design and planning. Yeah, so that's all, it's all, it's all 
put in documentation in Asana, basically. So what we try to do is we try to describe every task. So I actually start that process by describing it in kind of in my non-technical terms. This is the functionality. This is what should happen. This is how it should logically relate to this. Then our developer reads that and adds kind of the technical layer on top of that. But that really is what goes into that next sprint. So we've got a long list of things that we know we have to go through. Those are the steps that we need to take. So that's basically how we try to kind of keep track of what sure. happens. Sure, and, and how do you avoid the issue of, of focusing on lots and lots of small features as compared to getting some bigger features out the door? We have basically, so we've identified kind of the big features that we really want to be there in our kind of first launched Kay. product, what we Kay. call our MVP. Um, we try to be very strict in saying, okay, these are the features. We know there's lots of other things that could okay. be very cool and we'll add, but we've put them behind our milestone. Okay. So we know they're sitting there, they're prioritized once we get through this first milestone. Okay. And every week we reevaluate, like, is anything that came up really essential to make it into our first milestone? And does it relate to what we have prioritized? Okay. If it doesn't, it may be a great feature, but it won't be developed yet because we have to be pretty disciplined about what goes into the development. Pr pretty it much the rule of thumb is if it's a bug fix then it goes into this uh, milestone, if it's not a bug then it goes into the next milestone. Okay. Uh, and then there are things that we judge should go into this milestone but it's always a, a, a cost-benefit analysis of what's the cost of not including it versus what's the benefit of including it. Okay, so, and this is probably a little bit of a trick question since it's straight off my yeah. presentation, but uh, <laughs> so what do you use as the basis for evaluating the cost benefit? Actually, let, let's talk the benefit side. A cost comes based on your level of effort and accumulated technical debt Correct. and that. So cost is that. How do you evaluate the benefit side though? We actually, for us, so what I look at very much now is we have to prove that this product can engage users. So I have a few metrics that we're striving for and we hope that we will do well on those metrics. Those are very much engagement metrics. So they have okay. to do with, do people save favorites in our tool? Okay. Do they share these favorites with other people and therefore kind of get the word out about the tool? And do they go to our discovery part? Like do they find like other elements uh, that are important. Now, all those three pieces need to function. And if there is anything that we feel is essential to make these functionalities real, then we do really consider putting them in the tool. But it's really towards how do we make sure that we can evaluate that engagement, because we feel that those three pillars are pillars of engagement that we need to achieve in our kind of first product launch. And that's great. And it's so being laser focused like that on a particular goal and sort of some proof points it's probably hugely beneficial when you get into the discussions about, where, you know, you got this long list of backlog and okay, Correct. what are we exactly. really going to do? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. there are great features out there that we know could help us, for instance, on the acquisition side. And at some point, we will love to get yep. a massive amount of users. In the beginning, we need to focus on getting the kind of right core group of users and make sure that those users get engaged and that we understand what engages them, what doesn't engage yeah. them, and then we will go from there, kind of reevaluating yeah. all the features. Yeah, and of course that's that's always easier said than done, to understand Very much why so. they're engaging yes. and not, <laughs> yeah. and there'll be lots of iteration yes. around that. Yeah. So, yeah. so you two sort of have an advantage. You've already done one startup together. Yeah. You're, you actually come from a pretty strong product background, yeah. quasi-technical background. Do you still have challenges between, you know, the classic is between product and technology. Are there still places where there's challenges or if you're past all of that? No, I think that, that um, yeah, we never stop learning <laughs> from, <laughs> oh, yeah. from our mistakes. Um, I think that, that having the, the, the common background helps a lot because, because we can say a lot without uh, saying it. Um, but it, there is definitely a, a, a point where um, into everything that we do there has to be a, a very good conversation and a lot of data to support it. So I think that the data helps a lot. Now, you, And you've been doing this for a very long time, so a, as compared to when you've worked with other people, yeah. uh, what, what have you seen in other places that have been some of the bigger challenges for you as a, as a developer? So I think that from my background, um, a lot of time the, the developers drive the product. Um, and I think that that started to change a few years back. There has been a lot of emphasis in the industry about that um, not happening. 
Um, and I think that having a, a technical and a non-technical founder helps a lot with that, which I believe is the majority of, of startups nowadays. Uh, but I think that it's essential to have customer first, which is easier said than done. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's a great discussion. Uh, what my take takeaway from that is that you have to be strategic not only on the business side, but the, the coding and software development, it's, it's strategic in itself, how you set it up, um, whether to include, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a, what do you call it, a technical debt? Yes. Um, so it's really, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not just technical, it's really strategic at the same time. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Always big questions to answer. Well, thanks for your time here on the show today. And folks, uh, thank you. Uh, that's enough software development for today. Uh, now it's time to do the real work. Thank you, Tony Carr, and uh, favorite for the learning experience. And thank you for joining us today. We'll see you back next time for more Concept to Code.